Yeah, and it's a legacy for a reason. I mean, it's earned it. Yeah. You know, um, we've seen obviously in the music industry, we've seen, and the video industry and photography industry, we've seen tons of technologies come and go, and they don't stick. There's still a handful around that really do, and there's a reason why they do, and it's not just luck. I'm Reed Chippen. Um, this is my studio, Robot Lemon, in uh, uh, South Nashville, Tennessee. Old SSL board, bunch of old junk. Plugins, right? Hardware plugins. Um, and this is where I do a majority of my work, all of my mixing and, and production and, and stuff like that. I got my first fake ID at 15 so I could sneak into CBGB's, which is still the worst bathroom in the history of bathrooms. <laughs> um, yeah, but a fantastic club. And, um, you know, in New York, New York was, was interesting in the, um, in the 80s, to say the least. But there was a great music scene. So um, I spent a lot of time in the city doing that kind of thing. Grew up literally in the same town as Bruce Springsteen. Like, his, his house was on my way to high school. Like, we used to see him. I used to run with him at the park in Rumson because, you know, he's, he was out and around. When, uh, when the Born in the USA record came out, it was so big in New Jersey. I mean, it was a cultural phenomenon anywhere, but in New Jersey, it was ground zero. So, uh, man, I remember driving down the street and you could just, it was on the radio and you could put your car windows down and turn the radio off and you'd still hear it blasting because everyone was listening to that song. It was, it was super amazing. So, that's uh, that was one of that was one of my first falling in love with music experiences, like just on a on something more than yeah, I really like music, but man, just like sound and how exciting it was and just the way it felt and how can I do that and everything and then, you know I started couldn't Google back in that you know back in the day, so you start reading album credits and this guy's this one guy's name kept uh, popping up this guy Bob Bob Clearmountain like he did this he did that he did the other thing it's like man what's going on with this guy so that began kind of the fascination. Bruce Springsteen and that began the fascination with Clear Mountain, which actually also began the fascination with SSL because he was famously like the SSL guy. Bounced around for a little bit trying to figure out what I wanted to do and finally I said I'd rather be happy than safe and I kind of threw all the other stuff aside that I was doing and came down here and, and went to school full time, worked full time in the recording program at Middle Tennessee State, you know, and just spent all the time I could in the studios. I just started working. Like I started interning and then I started assisting and then I started getting records and I looked up 15 years later and I was like, man, I live in Nashville. This is so weird. Um, LA was never my thing and, and New York was really expensive. And, and, uh, and honestly, I think I just, I was concentrating on working so much that by the time I realized I should think about where I wanted to live, I was living here. The music community in Nashville Back when I got started, there were two music communities in Nashville. There was country and there was Christian. Those were your two options. That was it. Um, and I was from New Jersey, so I was just like, country music? I don't know anything about country music. That's, you know, whatever. I never listened to country music. For me, country music was, was Willie Nelson and uh, Hank Williams and Johnny Cash and, like, all that stuff. Um, like, not what was going on here. In the, in the late 90s and 2000s as far as country music goes. So I gravitated toward Christian because the, the, the Christian stuff, they would do pop and they would do rock and they would do hip hop and they would do like all of this stuff and that was all going on right here. So I kind of immersed myself in that, in that whole crowd and got to do pretty much everything in that, that genre, which was a great education because, you know, I mean, it was, you kept jumping around to all kind of different stuff and then as that was happening, indie rock and other stuff was starting to move into Nashville and there were starting to be little pockets of people doing like really cool music. And now when you look around, it's just, it's bizarre how much diversity of music there is in this town. LA attracts rock stars, Nashville attracts songwriters. Cause there's been a, there's been a long tradition of songwriting here. Um, and people follow songs. You know, you got to have great songs. Um, it's genre dependent, obviously. Rock music, a lot of times the artists will write a lot more country music. A lot of times it's coming from songwriters as opposed to the artists necessarily. But there's still that creative community and it just kind of magnetizes and brings people, brings people in. Even when Nashville wasn't the cool place to be, um, people were flying in here to 
write with the guys and girls who were writing in Nashville and like doing that kind of stuff. So that's my theory. That and it's, you know, it's affordable to live here. If you can get by without Italian food and bagels. <laughs> You know, I've been really lucky, especially in this town, to be able to work on a wide variety of genres. I get to I get to hop around between like rock and pop and hip hop and country and Christian and like Disney and I mean I you know, one day I'm doing an Ingrid Michaelson like pop record, the next day I'm doing Kenny Chesney country record, the next day I'm doing London Symphony Orchestra at Abbey Road with a Disney thing or whatever. Like that's Super awesome! Like I love it. It keeps it keeps things really interesting. Um, I think when people come to um, mix guys in particular, but also producers um, and even players, uh, they're coming for my they're coming for what I do. Now, I mean, I like to think that I can work on just about anything, and I have. Like I've maybe more than most. I get to hop around genres a lot, um, you know. But they're really just coming for my opinion because they must have heard something that I did that they said, oh, I really like the way that that goes. When I first started concentrating on mixing, which was a while ago, um, I realized very quickly that moving around to different studios when you were mixing was an incredibly bad idea um, because I felt like it wasn't my responsibility to be guessing. It was my responsibility to know. So pretty quickly I settled down into um, a small handful of studios and then finally one studio. I had always wanted to have my own room. And when the time came that I could actually swing that, I bought my desk and built my studio with a local studio designer and, you know, made, made records here ever since. This is the point where, where if, you're, if you're not a nice person, you lie. I'm almost tempted to just sit here and lie to you right now and just let you cut it in. It's like, oh, well, this is the console that, you know, like, um, like Roxy Music was mixed on. And, you know, I, I have no idea. I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea what the history is behind this console. Okay. Um, I, I got it from PAD. Um, they did an amazing job on it. I've had, like, almost no problems with it. It sounds phenomenal. It's, 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 uh, I got lucky, I think. It has some mods in the, in the compressor that I really like. You know, and uh, but I, I really don't have any idea what the history is on. I'm sorry. I really should just make something up, right? I just loved working on an SSL. There's, there's, how to explain this? Um, there are things that you can do on an SSL console that you can't do anywhere else. Um, there are plenty of things that you can do without an SSL console, and that's all fine. But when you need the specific things that uh, the console does, like there is no substitute for it. I mean, I mean there's, a, there's a ton of great guitars out there, but there's very few like 1956 Les Pauls. Um, you know, there's a lot of great sounding Les Pauls and there's, you know, but when you get the, the perfect one for the perfect usage and, and, and whatever, you know, when you have the, the right tool for the job, it's just, it just makes your life so much easier. And um, so that's, that's why I have this. There's, there's just things that I've tried uh, a bunch of different ways to to scramble the eggs, as it were, and I keep coming back to the same thing. So at some point, I just said, okay, well, because I love the way that thing sounds, and when I'm not using that, I could just skip it. I've got an SSL submixer, of which there are like three on the planet, but that exists so that I can skip around the board when I don't want to hear it and just have like a really clean summing thing, you know. Um, so that's 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 the workflow for that. Sometimes there's stuff that I do that never that never touches the console. A lot of the stuff that I do for Disney, like the film and TV or um, uh, stuff like that, we don't. I don't even bother with the console because it doesn't need it. And then the rock stuff is all going to go through it. So right. it's just on a case by case basis. That's a great question. And um, when I get into disagreements with. Um, friends who are like, well, why don't you just mix it in the box? Um, one of my, uh, one of my go-to answers to that is, is if I were, if I were recording everything that I did, especially certain genres, but let's just generalize and say, if I were recording it, I could probably mix it without the help of this thing, because I could hopefully 
given the time and, you know, I could fix most of the problems on their way in. This thing is genius for triage when I don't get to do that. Because if you, if you want to make something like a little bit this or a little bit that, there's a lot of things that can, that can do it. But if you, if you really need to have something just be like, boom, like, wow, like this is the only thing that does it. I, you know, I, I wish, I wish, I wish I could have this in my phone because then I could be mixing in a, on a beach in Bali. I mean, that would be awesome, right? But it, it's, it's, it's not, it's not going to happen. It just isn't. Uh, distortion is too complicated. You know, it just is. Um, so that, that's, yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, plus, that's the gig. I mean, the gig of a professional mixer is someone pour their heart and soul into this. Someone someone really cares about this like i'm gonna make it work no matter what i'm handed the last thing i'm ever gonna do unless it is literally a nightmare on wheels is to be like ah, this isn't good enough because you can i mean that's the job that's my job that's that's why people come to me is because i can take something and hopefully make it good enough You can do horrible things to drums on an SSL that you can't do to anything on anything else, period. Cool. You know, I'm looking at a couple of snare channels um, that are running in parallel, and there's, there's, you know, 15, 30, 60, 70, 80, 90 dB of gain in wow. some of these, like, snare channels, you know, aggregated together. There's, uh, there's something that the, that the SSL EQ does when you crank it that nothing else does. Um, especially on drums and electric guitars and sometimes uh, vocals even. Um, so that's one of the tricks. One of the tricks mixing on an SSL or honestly on any console is, is um, not, not being conservative about it, just cranking it. And that's, again, you know, one of the things that I always found frustrating about digital plugins is you, don't, you can't crank digital plugins. They, they do different things. You know, you can't use the distortion that you can in this console. Which is another thing that I really like about this desk. I mean, the the J is a fantastic desk, and and it sounded really great. But as we all knew, the one thing where the J fell down was it wouldn't distort; it would clip. It's like a totally different thing. With this, you can slam stuff through it. And when you need to do triage on a track, and when you really need something to speak, or you really need something to shift way over, or really need something to poke out, like you can just do damage to it on the desk, and it'll take it, and it'll be like a a. Uh, I think a musical form of distortion, or at least a very exciting form of distortion. Right, right. So, um, I use the desk for a lot of stuff like that, making things exciting, making uh, making things jump out. I had worked for a really long time trying to figure out a way to get the sound that I wanted, but to not be stuck in the traditional way we used to use consoles. Like, I'll tell you a story. I was working on a, a guy's record who shall remain nameless, Tommy. And uh, he, he said, I finished a mix on Tuesday afternoon. I called him and he said, dig, man, I'll be right down. And he got there Thursday night. Meanwhile, I was just sitting there because, you know, you don't want to touch the desk. You don't want to, you know, you don't want to do whatever. Like, you don't want to mess with it. That's the way we used to do records. Well, that doesn't fly anymore. It just doesn't. It's not, it's not efficient for the, um, the artist or the, the clients or the labels or even me. Like I don't, I don't want to sit around waiting on somebody. I want to get into something else. I want to go back to something really easily and listen to it. And so for the longest time, as the digital and the hybrid stuff started taking over, mostly digital, people said, well, you have to mix digital because you know it takes too long to recall on a console. Well, it takes us like two minutes to recall an entire song on a console. It's it's very, um, it's very common for me to have somebody to mix a record and have somebody come in on a Friday and we'll go through every song on the record and make all of our changes. Then we'll be done which is a fantastic workflow. So the way my studio is set up, again, in, in an insanely complicated way that would take three hours to explain, um, it's basically designed so that uh, half of what I use this for, the compression, the, the, the dynamic section, the EQ, um, is stuff that I will print or capture. Um, and the studio is set up in a way that I can listen to what's going on as an end product, not guessing what's going in and then listening to it back later and saying, oh, well, that's kind of what I thought I was going for. Some of it, and then the rest of it, the, uh, I mean, the other huge advantage, obviously, of any analog console is parallel processing. And when you, you know, all my parallels and all that stuff that's running, that's just running in real time. So anything that I run through it, you know, does what I want it to, and, and it's fast and easy. The books. Gotta give him credit. Richard Dodd, man, the guy is a freaking genius. So, uh, 
you know, Richard, Richard is an amazing person and has done, I mean, he did Wildflowers by Tom Petty. Like, he gets a pass for the rest of his life. That's, like, one of the coolest records ever. So when we were talking about doing this, I didn't want to, I wanted to set it up in a way that was way more comfortable, way more of a living room space. Um, the acoustic designer, this guy named Gary Hedden, has worked on all these great studios, but he was the first guy I ever talked to that said, um, I want to come to where you work. I want to listen to how you work. I want to listen to the stuff you're working on and how you listen and what kind of speakers you use before we even talk about designing, like, a space. And I was like, that's fantastic. So... When we got to um, down to talking about diffusion and stuff like that, Richard, my friend, said, well, you know, when we did Rick Rubin's studio in Malibu, we had bookshelves filled with books, and they worked really effectively at being great diffusers, plus they look cool. And that day or that week, bizarrely, I got on a local auction site. They had these four bookshelves, which fit perfectly. And then the guy that was working in here doing the trim, he said, you know, my buddy's got a law library he's not using. Do you want it? Done. That's Super talking. lucky. Yeah, this is a law library, which I haven't read. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then we turned them out because it's a little more absorptive and it looks much cooler. Man, you know, that thing is, is awesome. <laughs> um, okay, I, I, yeah, there's a couple secrets. Uh, they're not really secrets, they're kind of more open secrets. One of the things about the bus compressor is it sounds really, really great on mid-range and it will sometimes collapse high-end and it will sometimes react poorly to low-end. So some of the really high-endy stuff, I'll skip the bus compressor and like um, sometimes, depending on the music, the kick drum will skip the bus compressor because I don't want the kick drum to like pull everything else down. But it's just amazing for taking um, like the mid-range of the drum kit and the uh, vocals and the guitars and just kind of making a soup like a just kind of knitting it all together it's a it's a fantastic tool i love it i actually use it for tracking too it's really nice for cutting pianos and um uh drum overheads and stuff like that you know sometimes acoustic guitars stuff like that it's really fun Uh, parallel compression is something that's very easily done in analog that is sometimes problematic in digital even still, uh, which is kind of a bummer because it's super useful. I mean, parallel compression is, is taking, taking a signal, splitting it out, running that signal through a compressor or a limiter and blending it back into the original signal, sometimes just a little bit, sometimes obliterating it and bringing in a very, very small bit of it. And I, I find, I find because I have access to this and I can do it, um, I have the back bus. I have parallel compression on, on all the, uh, all the drums when I want it. In fact, it gets compressed like f three or four times because at this point, the drums are going through the desk. They're going through the quad bus compressor. The drums are also going through the back bus. That's going through the quad bus compressor. The back bus goes out externally through another set of compressors gets blended back into the console so that's going back through the quad bus compressor again so at this point you know the the drums the drums on on um ingrid's record were went through the quad bus compressor three times on each song simultaneously all at the same time um and it takes it takes it took me a long time to figure out how to get that stuff balanced but when you get that balance it's great because you get the impact of the drums and then you get all the really cool stuff that the drummer's doing in between everything you can still hear all that instead of it just being like you know kick snare and nothing and i'm sure there's guys out there that make amazing records without using it at all in fact you could probably go talk to gary pachosen about doing allison krauss records i don't know that he uses parallel compression at all but that's a certain kind of music for pop stuff and rock stuff especially and you know stuff where you're blending acoustic instrument and electronic instruments the the parallel compression lets you let the acoustic stuff hold its own with the electronic stuff um, without doing damage to the original performance if you're going to go cut a guitar and then you're just going to obliterate everything the guitar player was playing by crushing it so you can like stick it out two speakers and make it hold up to a, a synth you know it's like why even bother cutting in the guitar but you know and for some stuff i guess it doesn't matter but for some stuff it's just huge so that's um i mean i think that's a that's something that this desk actually helped 
this series helped develop parallel compression. Like you couldn't do it until the 4000 came out. And that's why, that's why it's called New York compression because one of the first places outside of England that all the 4000 deaths went into were New York. All these guys were up there cranking on it and you know, coming up with basically parallel compression. I'm sure it started with Clear Mountain and those guys, you know, and TLA and CLA certainly like took it home. But I don't know how you could do parallel compression and then compressing the send and then sending that out, compressing that, bringing that back in and having it go through the mix bus again without inducing latency or phase problems. And that's, and that's, you know, it's really unfortunate. It's kind of the, it's kind of the Achilles heel on, on digital. Some music, it really doesn't matter, but where you really, on some of the stuff that you really want to use it on, you can't because the phase problems that you get into starts to take away the benefit of being able to do it, you know? So that's been, I think, probably a frustration for anyone who's trying to mix in the box and wants a certain specific technique or sound that that this allows this allows you to have so you know i don't know I, i'm the, i'm the guy who spent sorry honey an egregiously exorbitant amount of money and time trying everything like i wanted to try all the compressors and all the reverbs and all the outboard stuff and just is this better than that is that better than this and just slowly over years kind of distilled it down to stuff that's really really great and um and some of the outboard stuff that i use the the settings don't move because like yes this piece can work on six different things but where it really shines is this one thing and i'm lucky enough to have two of them so i can use this one for the one thing it's great at and it's always just going to do that great thing and then i have something else i can use for something else um so that's i mean that's one of the tricks to to this setup and the other one is digital and hybrid mixing and plugins let you take the best part of analog and just kind of like zoom zoom up on it. It's like having binoculars, right? So when you have something that's just really, really great, you can just kind of crank it up right in front of you and it's, it's super fun. Everybody likes to talk about gear because gear's really fun. If you're trying to make music, record music, uh, mix music in a really crappy room that doesn't sound good with no treatment on bad speakers it doesn't matter if you have a million dollar console it doesn't matter if you're in the you have the best gear in the world if you don't know what you're hearing so a lot of people love to I mean, everybody loves to talk about gear so like dude what's your favorite this or what what should i buy next and i'm like make sure your monitoring is great make sure your speakers are great otherwise you're just guessing you know you might get lucky but i, I don't want to get lucky you know i just i want to be consistent I mean, hey, we get, we get paid to listen to music. This is like the best job in the world. So, yeah, I'm just happy to be here. <laughs>